Welcome back class. Good to be with you. We are in Ugarte, Milotino, and Arnhold, uh, chapter 3, section 4. Uh, we got page 87 here. And we're going to talk about random variables. So again, this is the second one of these that I'm doing. You might have had a couple more if I made them later, but number two. And so we're just going to step through the chapter or this section and see see how we're doing. So random variables. This is a fundamental concept that we're going to use for the rest of the course and all of next semester in statistics. So I want to just put in some big picture remarks. I think the stuff in the book is pretty understandable. So here we go. Uh, it says right here, in many experiments, it's easier to study some function of the outcomes than it is to study the original outcomes. That's true, uh, but le let's try to get at what's going on here. Uh, he gives an example. If you got 20 students asked whether they favor legislation to reduce ozone emissions, no one would ever think of it this way. But what it says is correct. There are therefore 2 to the 20th power, that is 1 million sum, possible outcomes. What does that mean? Well, it means that number one might have said yes when number two said no, or number one might have said no when number two said no, and then go on and enumerate all 20 students. Now, it's absurd to think of that list of one million possible yes-no combinations the 20 students would give, okay? Uh, but Underneath it all, that is actually what's going on. So a random variable is to say, we don't care which one said what. We just care how many said yes. So let's just boil it down to that. And what that does is it gives us 0 to 20. So I'd like to write it like this. Uh, the random variable x is a function that maps from omega the sample space into uh, R, the real numbers. So functionally, that's what's going on underneath of it, even though actually you won't really notice this or see this going on. OK, so that's, that's what we got. Now, just a few examples are listed here. Uh, a random variable that we think about you might have uh, a deck of cards being given the drawing of a single card from the deck okay that has discrete possibilities okay but it's still a random variable um, now let's think of these decks of cards and we might say uh, we draw two cards what is the sum of their faces? If you map the ace as a 1, 2 through 10 is clear, jack 11, queen 12, king 13, then if you were to draw, let's say, two kings, then that would be a 13 plus 13, would be a 26. And so your random variable x is going to equal the sum of two cards. Now, whether you replaced before you drew the second one out or not, that would have an effect upon the probability distribution of the outcomes. Uh, but the space is still going to move from 2 through 26. Those are the possible uh, values for that random variable. OK, now, of all random variables, there are discrete and continuous. So we'll start our discussion here with the discrete ones. Uh, they make a little notational remark that we'll tend to think of x as a random variable. x is going to follow some distribution. And that's true, and I love this notation, but they don't really use it much until next chapter. So we'll just put that in the back of our mind. Now. We're going to look at the important properties of random variables. Again, read through this, but I'm just trying to highlight kind of what the key pieces are. So as you're reading it, 
everything's not on a level playing field. Uh, there's two very fundamental uh, properties of random variables. There's your PDF and your CDF. Okay, PDF stands for probability density function, and uh, sometimes if you have more technical writers, they'll distinguish probability mass function (PMF) for discrete random variables and PDF for continuous random variables. Our book just calls them all PDF, and that's it's very convenient to do that. Okay, uh, there's two uh, two conditions that a PDF must satisfy here, and that just doesn't really help much. All probabilities are greater than or equal to zero. They all sum to one. Okay, fine. Uh, let's get an example right away. And the book has, I think, a pretty good example here. Uh, and that is a triple coin toss. That's what I call this. So I'm going to write it down. Triple coin toss. Here's the outcomes to the triple coin toss. You can see them. And the random variable that we're interested in could take other random variables on a triple coin toss. But we'll use the number of heads, which appears. Now, considering the number of heads, this event has three. These three events have two. These three events have one. And this one here has a zero. So what that does then is for my random variable, the possible outcomes are zero, one, two, three. Okay. It's the, uh, the values of the random variable. And then the probabilities are, well, to get a 0, there was only one way. And there's 8 total, and each one is equally likely. So that's a 1 out of 8. There's 3 out of 8 for the 1, and 3 out of 8 for the 2, 1 out of 8 for the 3. Okay. Now, this is called a probability distribution right here where you have the random variable mapped with all of the, the probabilities for each possible outcome of the random variable. OK. Now, the PDF, then, is simple when you have an actual random variable to work with. Okay, Namely, and rather than sketch it, I'm going to go ahead and use our book, because you bought the book. We paid good money for it. Okay, You can type or copy these lines. And it's going to make a beautiful little picture here on the next page. And this is the PDF. Now, what we would typically draw it like is we put the bars on like this. So you'd have three, uh, four bars that are going to look like that. All right. But the zero case is 1 eighth. The case of 1 goes to 3 eighths. The case of 2, 3 eighths. The case of 3, 1 eighth. <clears throat> now, back to those two properties. One of them is they're greater than or equal to 0 in probability, and their sum is 1. That means if you stack all of the bars on top of each other, it's going to go up to 100%. Okay? So each bar simply represents the probability associated with those particular values of the random variable. That's the PDF. It's intuitive. It's beautiful. OK, let's hit the next one. Now, the next one here is called the CDF, and that's cumulative distribution function. OK, now, fancy formula, <clears throat> probability that x is less than or equal to x. OK, now, uh, you can write that with a summation notation, and then it gives four properties. I'm going to go ahead and let you read those four properties. I want to just go right to our example and see what, what's going on here. Okay, the CDF is directly related to the PDF. It's just cumulative. So I have 1 eighth for the 0. Boom. At 0, I'm going 1 eighth. So there it is right there. Now, adding this 1. There's 3 eighths for the 1, so we're going cumulative. Uh, the 0 here, you could think of it as probability that x equals 0. At this 1, instead of probability that x equals 1, we're going probability that x is less than or equal to 1. So I'm going to take and add the first two bars. That gives me 4 eighths. Boom, we're right there. 
And then uh, CDF is a continuous function. So at 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, whatever, uh, it's just staying flat. So it's a stepwise function. And it goes over. Once you hit 2, boom, we're going to add on the next 3 eighths. So boom, it jumps up here. And uh, does go like this. So now it's up to 7 eighths. And once you hit the 3, boom, it goes to 1. When you're looking at the four properties of the CDF, you'll notice that the limit as x goes to negative infinity, it, it just stays at 0. So this is just sitting at 0. That way we're defined over the whole real line. And then this guy, as its limit goes to infinity, uh, it is 1. So once you, you reach that 1, then it just stays flat on the 1. And that's a CDF. They're, for discrete variables, they're always a stepwise function. OK, so that gives us PDFs and CDFs. And that's kind of what, what you're trying to abs uh, extract when you're doing that reading. Now, let's go to the next section, expected values. OK, the expect, uh, no, we have mean, median, mode. There we go. <clears throat> OK, these are properly properties of random variables. So mode. It gives you a technical definition. It's the x value most likely to occur. I do not like that definition. Um, all the mode is, if you look at the PDF, it's the peak. Okay. So in the triple coin toss, the peak here is one or two. Okay. So you can say that it has two modes, um, or you could say that it's it's one to two coins, or excuse me, one to two heads. That's fine. Uh, so think of the mode as a graphical property, not a, a number uh, that you just get from the data. Median. OK, median is, as you know, it's that dotted line in the middle of the road. So median is just the middle of the distribution. So again, you go to your PDF, and it's the halfway point. Halfway of what? Uh, halfway on the probabilities. So my median here, let's just grab another color. Boom, 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 boom. It is 1.5. That's halfway. 50% uh, is on the left. 50% is on the right. OK, that's, that's it. Now, how do you find that number? Well, uh, hmm. that's a good question. Uh, basically, you take your set of all possible values. And in our case, we have, there's a three, there's three twos, there's one, 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 and there's a zero. OK, this is theoretical. If you were to just toss a bunch of coins, then you could do this empirically. Um, but uh, it's anywhere between one and two. You can tell you got four values that are smaller. You got four that are greater. So technically, the median is anything between one and two, and convention we just use the midpoint of the middle two if it's an even number. If it's an odd number, you just pull that exact number out and call it the median. OK, that's how you do it by hand. Now, next concept is the percentile. And the percentile, as it says, uh, the jth percentile is a number. So the answer is it's a number, just like median is a number may or may not be part of the set of possible values, such that the probability that x is below it is greater than or equal to uh, that j over 100. And the probability that x is greater than or equal to it is greater than or equal to 1 minus j over 100. OK, so let's go back to the example again. OK, you can easily get some percentiles from your PDF. So uh, this number right here uh, at, at 0.5, that 0.5 is going to be the 1 8th percentile. And let's just take note that 1 8th equals 0.125. So that's going to be your 0.125th percentile. At 1.5, 
that will be our 50th percentile. So let me wipe that out. 50th, and I said 0.125th. Let me just say 12.5th. Okay, moving over here between two and three, that'd be the 2.5. Uh, that's going to be 7 eighths, so 87.5th percentile. There's no such thing as a zeroth percentile or a hundredth percentile, unless you want to stipulate that it's the maximum and the minimum. That would be fine. And you'll sometimes see that written that way. Okay. A comment about this 0.125. We have two things. We have percentiles. This isn't in the book, but you're going to hear a term called quantile. All the quantile is, is take your percentile and divide it by 100. Uh, it just gets the number on a 0 to 1 scale. Uh, that's used in statistical literature more frequently than percentile. Okay, and in R, you don't have a percentile command, but you do have a quantile command. So you get quantiles. Multiply by 100 if you want percentile. OK, excellent. Now, in addition to mode, median, percentile, we have expected value. Uh, the expected value is the mean, but it's a more technical term for the mean, and it's a more generalizable term, if I can put it that way. Okay. Um, we're going to use this notation for it, e with the brackets x, so that's e of x, you can say. And it's the sum of x times the probability of x. OK, so how do you do that? Well, let's just quickly repro yeah, let's reproduce our triple coin toss uh, table, because I want to reuse this for something else as well. So we have the 0, 1, 2, 3. So if you were to attempt to take the mean of this, then we could just add up the possible values. You have a 0. You've got three ones, three twos, and a 3. And looking at that, let's see, I've got 3, 9, 12. I've got 12. So 12 over 8 is going to be 1.5. So that would be the mean, just to add up all the possible values, right? The expected value says that's true, but that's a lot of work. What if you had a random variable that had hundreds or thousands or millions of possible values? You wouldn't want to do that. Instead, you can just use the probability distribution, and we'll get the same result that's embedded in this formula. So we have a 1 8 we have a 3 eighths, 3 eighths, 1 eighth. Now, uh, take x times probability of x. So I get 0, 3 eighths, 6 eighths, and 3 eighths. If you pay attention to this list, you'll see where they fit in. Add this column up, you get the same exact 12 eighths that was over here. So we get the same result, 1.5. You can think of that as a weighted mean, weighted by the probability for each possible value of the random variable. OK. Uh, we don't need to do the example here, because we did our own. And we're finishing up on this section. A very nice little set of R scripts. This is instructive on uh, the vectorized notation. Please run that. OK, little theorem here. Uh, the book just makes little of it, doesn't even name it. But it's called the Unconscious Statistician Theorem. And it's, it's very powerful. And it's so intuitive that you really don't think of it much. But uh, if you take a function of the random variable, Okay, and a function of our random variable with the triple coin toss, a very common one, instead of x, we might consider x over n. 
where in our case it's three because I've got three coins. So instead of zero, one, two, three, we're interested in what's the, the basically a probability of zero to one. Okay, uh, the proportion of tosses which were heads. Okay, so that would be a function g of x. Okay, well to get the expected value, you can kind of cheat and you don't have to use the definition of expected value on uh, this transformation. You can just plug it in directly. So here's how it works. Uh, we're just going to go back over to my table and g of x, let's do g of x, it's uh, 0, 1 third, 2 thirds, 3 thirds, which is 1. Okay. And then let's make a g of x, p of x column. And so 0 times 1 eighth is 0. 1 third times 3 eighths is 3 twenty fourths. 3 eighths times 2 third is 6 twenty fourths. 1 eighth times 1 is 3 twenty fourths. Adding those up, I get 12 twenty fourths, which is 0.5. Okay. Now, taking that 0.5, let's just look. On this scale, I'm going to go ahead and erase my percentiles. When I do, that's 0. 1 third, 2 thirds, 3 thirds. 0.5 is right here. And that's the exact center, which is the expected value. And it corresponds to the 1.5 on the other scale. So we're hitting the exact same mark. And that's the unconscious statistician theorem. And the book has a very nice example which I leave for you to look at. And uh, if, if you'll indulge me, I want to go over a little proof of this. Uh, I haven't decided yet whether I would put this on an exam and that that's not a threat, but there are places in our book that are just a little bit light for uh, the level of math program that we're running here. And so I'm going to just add a few proofs and a few things as I've been doing in the class. So uh, let's let y equal g of x. Now on my diagram here, we have uh, y equals g of x. And a is the set of values of x. So p of x is the straightforward probability distribution. That's just x. And then you have p of x. And boom, that's our whole distribution, just as we've been doing. Okay, But if you take a function of x, then that maps over into a new space here, uh, of which an element, y sub i, is going to come from this, this x sub i. Now, uh, they may not be in a one-to-one -one mapping. There may be uh, x1, x2, x3 might all map onto y1, possibly. Okay, now this y has its own probability distribution. So y and p of y, and I'm just depicting that in the diagram simply. So by definition, expected value of y is right here. It's the sum of y times probability of y. You can check that definition. Now, p of y, this is the probability of y component, looks like this. And this is the whole crux of the matter right there. So if you had the case where multiple x's mapped to a single y, then you would have to add up every single one of those x's to get the probability of, uh, of that particular y. So this is for the case uh, some i. Now, with that in place, here's the probability of y. So in our definition, we're going to stick this right up into that spot. And it looks like this. So expected value of y is the sum of y's times the probability of y's, which are sums of probabilities of x's. 
Now, uh, for a particular i, it's in this summation index, so this y can go over, and I switch it so I have a double sum. And let's see, y is just g of x, so I'm subbing in g of x right here. Now, for that particular x, you'll notice that the y's are now gone. So, uh, since the y's are gone, I can group these two sums into a single sum over all x's. Here, it's x grouped by these sets of ai's, and now I don't need that distinction anymore. So just put them all in one big summation, and boom, we got it. And that's the proof. So it's not hard, but it was skipped in the book. Okay, and we want to pay attention to these kind of details. Now, the very last item here is rules of expected value. Uh, and it gives two of them. Very nice. I want to just prove this general one right here. So if you have expected value of a plus bx, x is a random variable, little a, little b are constants. Okay. By definition, we come in here and we're just going to take the sum over a plus bx. Uh, let's move to a lowercase x, little x i. Capital X is the random variable itself. Lowercase is a particular realization of it. So we'll take the sum over i. Okay, times probability of x i. Now, uh, distributive property kicks in. So I'm just going to have a p of x i plus b x i p of x i. And that's the entire sum here. Okay, now uh, let's look at the first component. You're going to have a times the sum of the p's. Okay, and then the second component, I'm going to factor out that b, and I'll have the sum of x i p of x i. Okay, now the sum of the probabilities, as you've learned, must add up to 100 percent. That's the definition of a probability distribution. So the A comes out, and you'll notice this is exactly the definition of expected value. So I'm going to have B X, and I'm done. OK, so expected value is a linear operator. The constants can come out additively. And if they're multiplied on, then they just come out uh, in a multiple. So. Uh, oh, and I put x here. It's not x. It's e of x. And that's done.